So our next speaker is Ron Graham, who obviously needs no introduction. The title of his talk is Monochromatic Solutions to Linear Equations. Thank you. Well, it's great to be back here. Uh, I've known Krishna for quite a few years, and Florida was a standard stop on air issues for trips around the world. Stan Uwan was here, and Gene Larson was a there, and, uh, and uh, we always have a lot of fond memories uh, of visiting here. In fact, I used to live in Florida, in Fernandina Beach, which was almost in Georgia. So what I thought I'd do today is uh, talk a little, a little bit about a different aspect of number theory than lots going on here. And uh, you might call it, as Barry Mason likes to call it, combinatorial number theory. And uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, give a little background introduction, some of the basic results, some of the current things going on, and many open problems. So. Uh, Starts in some sense with Schur, who was looking at modular forms of Fermat's last theorem. Does this congruence, x to the n plus y to the n equals e to the n, mod p have non trivial solutions? And it led him to look at the following result, Schur's theorem from 1916, that if you partition the integers into finite and many classes, and at least one of these classes contains solutions to x plus y equals c. Many equations. Well, let me get some notation. We'll just let bracket n be the integers from 1 through n. Chi will just be mapping from n into integers 1 to r. I think of it as r coloring. And the color classes are partition n. In our color classes, an object in a single class will be called monochromatic. And we can restate Schur's theorem by saying that any R coloring of n is always a monochromatic solution to the equation x plus y plus Okay? Well, not long after that, the celebrated theorem of Van der Waarden in 1927 states that any R coloring of the integers it's a monochromatic arithmetic progression of length k. So there's a picture of young Van der Waarden. Special case of k equals 3. And the R coloring of n is a monochromatic solution to x plus y equals 2z. Z is the average of x and y. So x, z, y is a three term progression. Well, what's wrong with x plus y equals 3z? Well, why not? Well, in fact, there is a four coloring of n that has no monochromatic solution to this. Why? Well, here's the coloring. Namely, take an integer n, factor out the largest factor of 5, and what's left is 5k plus i, i, 1, 2, 3, or 4, and you're going to color that integer color i. You do that. One line computation shows you can't get monochromatic solution x plus y plus 3z. Okay, so the three equations behave a little differently. Well, in general, you call an equation, a homogeneous linear equation, R regular, if every R coloring of the integers must contain a monochromatic solution. And you say that it's regular if it's R regular for every R. Just standard notation. Which equations are regular? Rado, who was a student of Schur, by the way, showed that a homogeneous linear equation is regular if and only if you can solve it with x equals 0 or 1, not all 0. So for example, x plus y equals z, x plus y equals 2z, but not x plus y equals 3z. And uh, that takes care of one equation, but if you have a whole lot of equations. Well, in general, if you have an integer matrix, n by n matrix A, you can look at this A times the vector x, 0, as a system of homogeneous linear equations. For example, this matrix here, 
you spell out those three equations, you'll get x1 of x5 that corresponds with arithmetic progression of length 5. And so, and which matrices are going to be have systems of regular equations? Well, there's a condition called the Collins condition, which is this condition. Namely, it says, suppose you can partition the columns of your matrix into blocks so that the sum of all the columns in the first block is zero, and for all the other blocks, the sum of this columns is a rational linear combination of the earlier columns. Okay, so for example, take this matrix here. I claim it satisfies the columns condition. Why? Well, if you look at the first three columns, and their sum is the all zero vector, and the fourth column is a rational linear combination of the previous columns. So, and the punchline is that the system is regular if and only if it satisfies the columns. And here's kind of an appropriate picture for this meeting. It's Paul Erdish, Richard Rada, and actually 20 years since Paul has left us, but his spirit is still alive. And, uh, well, okay. Even though these equations, x plus y equals a, x plus y equals c, are both regular, there's actually a fundamental difference between them. We'll see a little bit later. Now, Vandermeer's theorem says that when you are color the integer, you must get arithmetic progression of length k in a single color. Then Erdős and Turin ask, okay, well, which color class? You have to have them. Which class actually has them? And they made kind of a natural conjecture that the densest class should have them. And by that, we mean you take a subset of integers and look at the upper density lim soup of the number of integers in S that are less than equal to N, divided by N, if that's positive, that should be a possible way to give a term arithmetic progressions. Well, equivalently, if you set R sub K of N be the size of the largest subset of one to N that has no K term arithmetic progression, then they conjecture that R K of N is little O N. Okay. And, uh, but even R3 of N wasn't going to be so simple, because not long after, Barron showed that R3 of N is at least greater than N times E to the minus constant square root log N. If you don't see those a lot, but in particular implies that it's greater than N to the 1 minus epsilon very epsilon. So this R3 of N already is a little of N, but bigger than any polynomial. So what is it? In fact, we still know very little about that. But the first non-trivial upper bound was given by Roth, 54, to show that R3 of n was least big O of n over log O n. This was improved now and then along the ways Rogan, various people. The current record, as I understand, is Bloom that has R3 of n is big O of n to the fourth power of log O n over log n. And uh, if you can get rid of this log log n to the fourth power, so it would just be n over log n, then you'd be very close to showing the primes already on the progress, just because there's so many of them, not a particular structure, but uh, so far that's, that's resistant. What about R k of n? Well, Samaradi 69 showed R4 of n was little o n, and that was a warm up to a 74 paper. R k of n was little o n, a tremendous achievement, which has now uh, been kind of extended and, and uh, used quite a lot by Gowers and Green and Powell. I think many people know about that. was Erdős' first thousand dollar problem that uh, Samaritan got. There's a picture of young Samaritan next to my house in New Jersey. <laughs> then first of all, Gess Nelson showed by ergodic theory method that uh, R k of n was little o n. Gower's R4 of n is n over the power of log logs. And the 2001 R k of n. And then R k of n equal little o n was worth a million dollars. <laughs> Somebody more distinguished than other dollars. So, so that, was, that was good. 
Now, Gower's last result can be used to obtain the best bound on the Van der Varden function. What is, what is that function? Well, the consequence of Van der Varden's theorem, the finite version says there's always for every n a least number, w of n, so that any two coloring of the integers from one of the w of n always must contain a monochromatic k term, n term arithmetic progression. And Gower's as a result of his work showed that it's less than 2 to the 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 n plus 9. Now that was a tremendous improvement of what was done. Van der Waard's original proof was a double induction, and it didn't even give a primitive recursive up or down. Schillau later had, instead of a double induction, two inductions, and he gave a bound that was in the fifth level of the Gorchik hierarchy. Towers of 2, whose length was the Tower of 2, and you have n of those, so that was, that was actually a big, a big improvement. And, uh, so, uh, what happened was, I had a conjecture that W of n was less than a tower of 2 of height n. And uh, I lost that conjecture. <laughs> so this is at the meeting in Hungary where actually... Actually, at this meeting, I will... Uh, I have a promise to settle another uh, Erdős conjecture of a slightly larger amount on the gaps between consecutive primes, but I will, I'll be doing that at the appropriate time. Uh, anyway, uh, the best lower bound on the Van der Waarde number is still due to Berlikan, 1968. It's basically n times 2 to the n, uh, when n plus 1 is prime. These are the known values. And it didn't really blow up. So uh, I have a brave conjecture. It should be less than 2 to the n squared. We try to prove that. Well, anyway. OK, now, if you are color, the integers up to n, and now you get monochromatic 3 term progressions, how many? How many do you get? Well, as a general result, a Frank old riddle and myself, for any regular system of equations, a positive fraction of all the solutions must be monochromatic. So when you are code the integers, however many solutions there are, a positive fraction of those should be monochromatic. And if you take, say, a single equation, and you let f sub e sit up the minimum possible number of monochromatic solutions, then you'd like to study what is how does what does this function look like? For example, x plus y equals z, it's known by work of Doran and others, that the answer is actually <coughs> n squared over 22. And that's really tight. That's actually the, the right answer. In fact, it's even, when the n's a multiple of 11, I think it's even, you know, there's the big O1 terms. Okay. Well, what about three-term arithmetic progression? X is y is 2z. Let's try to color the integers, minimize the number of monochromatic solutions. You know you have to get some, but let's try to get too many. Well, you know that it contains about n squared over 4 three term arithmetic progressions. If you color these randomly, about a quarter of them will be monochromatic. So, you know, coloring randomly, you should have about that many. What well, can you beat that? Yes, yes, you can. That's not that's possible. Hmm. Recently, it's been shown there is a two coloring, but she has only 117 over 2192 n squared. Now you say, is that really, is that the truth? Uh, is, that, is that a beautiful number? Yes, I think it is. Yeah. So, and that's one of about 18.7, which is better than 116. Okay, good. Well, what does this such a coloring look like? Well, if you take the integers from 1 to n, you break it into blocks, and these are the relative sizes of the blocks. This is 12 blocks symmetrically, actually anti-symmetric, and this coloring gives exactly that number. Okay. Now, the other direction, it's known kind of a complicated numerical computation. You must have at least this number, 170, 1675, or 32768, which we all recognize, which is uh, less than our upper bound, luckily. Uh, now, how do we get how do we get 117 over uh, 2192? Well, 
here's what happens. You're going to start with, say, 100,000 integers, all colored blue. And now you start going from the left, and you change the color if it actually decreases the total number of monochromatic free terms of regression. It goes to change one at a time. And then you go back and change it again. And you go back and forth, back and forth, each time trying to change the color if it actually decreases the number. And at the end, you finally have a stable situation where no individual one can be changed. OK, good. That's, well, OK, let's, let's do it again. There's another random star. Well, there's another random star. Here's a start when you start it all blue at the top. If you look at these pictures, what do they have in common? They're all converging to this block structure, the same block structure. You do it a thousand times, always converge to the block structure. Now, they don't always, this breakpoint isn't always exactly the same. It might be just a little bit off. So we believe that the truth here is 117 and and uh, here's what you do. Once you get this approximate picture, now there's a perturbation argument that works as follows. Suppose you had an approximate block structure. You thought, this is pretty close to optimal. OK? Well, so here's your kind of block structure you think is pretty close. What you're going to do is put the same block structure on the y-axis, and then you're going to color these squares in here. So in here, this is blue, and this is blue. So any point x, y in here, they're both blue. Or here, they're both red. And now, what about the points x plus y over 2? Well, between beta 1 and beta 2, they're all blue. So anything in here, which is blue, would correspond to a three-term arithmetic regression. x, y, x plus y over 2, all blue. Anything in here, be all red. Okay, so what happens if you now perturb, say, beta 3 just a little bit, then you maybe lost a little red and gained a little blue. And in the stable situation, this total should be the same. And if you can do that carefully, you'll end up with a system of linear equations. For our block structure, it looks like this, and the corresponding checkerboard looks like that. And the corresponding equations you get is this. And solving these, you get these values. And these are the block sizes. And that gives you that. OK, so we strongly believe that this, this is the right answer. Uh, another equation, x plus 2y equals 3z, you get a similar anti-symmetric block structure. There's another random star, same thing. Here's this algorithm to x plus y equals z, which is the Seidelberg result. And it's known that this is the right, this is the right answer, the known optimal coloring, 411, 611, 111s. This is not symmetric. This is not a density regular equation. That is, the equations x plus y equals 2z have the property that any solution you translate it is still a solution. And in the terms of the solving the equations, the Rado condition, the all ones vector is a solution. X plus y equals 2z. X plus y equals z, all ones is not. So you don't get the symmetrical thing. Well, so I'll show you the best known patterns for looking at some of the other equations. Ax plus by equals cz where a plus b equals c. These are density regular, all ones and solutions. You expect kind of symmetrical things. And, and we do the same thing. You do this perturbation method, get approximate block structure, set up the linear equation, solve it, you get, you get the, the values. And uh, I'll show the pictures where the coefficient of n squared is what you do if you color randomly, and the coefficient alpha is the best known configuration. And we'll look at this ratio here, which we hope is less than 1. Better. It's better than random. OK. So here's x plus y equals 2z. And here's our fraction 117.92. So 0.85 of random. And the block structure is that. 
x is y equals 2z, there's that. x is 0 equals 4z, 5z. Now, now you get more blocks, you get more linear equations, and you're going to get a little bit bigger numbers. And this is the OIS, yes? Pardon? And the numerator is the OIS. Are all? Are we in the online Wikipedia? Because the difference is the sequence of numerators and numbers. Well, it's okay. You can you can see. So here's two x plus five. Minutes. Okay. Uh, look at more. These are these are pretty nice. Those are pretty nice. Uh, if you start getting a little bit larger coefficients, things like this. Uh, can this really be the truth? Uh, well, so I collect information of the, the computations we're done. So this is A over B, where A plus B equals C, C. So, the, uh, for example, the one A is 1 and B is 1, that's X plus Y equals 2Z, and that's kind of right in here someplace. Uh, and you'd think that this should be kind of a continuous because pretty good partitions for one equation, if the equation is very similar, should be a pretty good partition. But there's a strange anomaly right here, of two thirds, of two thirds. Two x plus three y equals five z. And uh, what happens if you look at that equation? So this curve, for example, does it stay below 0.95 or is it 10 to 1? I have no idea, I have no idea. But uh, here, Two x plus okay, so okay, here. Two x plus three y equals five z. Here's what the heuristic algorithm produced. It produced this thing. It's starting all blue, and coming down here, what happens? These are red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. They're not solid blocks at all. They're alternating. And then blue, red, blue, red, blue, red. The blocks kind of change that way. So. There'd be alternating blue, red, and red, blue strings that are again symmetrical. Uh, and presumably that's the best thing to do, although we don't know. We don't know. What's different about that equation? I don't know. And things that are close to that, 10x plus 7y plus 17z is, is kind of, doesn't converge. It's kind of, anyway. None of these colorings have been able to prove. Only x plus y equals 2z. That's the only one where we know the coefficient. Uh, what about other equations? What if you try this for four-term ATs? Four-term equations. Well, we tried it, you got kind of a mess, and then it turns out that actually Lou and Pum found a true coloring which only has two-thirds of the number of monochromatic four-term ATs that are random on it. And this coloring is this. Right into the base 11, and now look at the large, the smallest index that's non-zero and color in red if that smallest index is non-zero is a quadratic residue and blue if it's not. And that coloring is a coloring that just this heuristic argument couldn't find. It just couldn't find that. So are there other things lurking that couldn't find? I don't know. Uh, now let me kind of wind up with some open problems. Church theorem says for all R, there's an R coloring uh, of the integers, unless you have monochromatic solution. But the finite version says, how far do you have to go to guarantee a monochromatic solution if you are R colored? It's known that it's between, actually, it's a little bit bigger than pi, but pi is kind of easier than that. An exponential on the bottom and a factorial on top. And an old problem of Erdős, worth $100, is that limit. The r root divided by r, is that actually less than infinity or not? I don't know, it's been open in 40 years. Uh, here's one of my favorite problems here. It's what we call off-diagonal end of our number. That is, you're going to color the integers up to w of kl, red or blue, in such a way that you either must have a red k-term regression or a blue three-term regression. Not K in both of them, but just, okay, so the question is, how does this number grow when you find your guarantee to have that? Well, here's some of the values that are known, in fact, it's known up to about 35 now. 
To plot them, it looks like this. Any conjecture? I strongly believe it's bounded by a polynomial. It's got to be, right? But it's only known a little bit bigger than k squared and less than an exponential. This comes from the known result. And uh, so Ben Green and I had kind of a discussion. I thought it's polynomial. I said, no, I think not. But after you look at the data, especially it keeps going up to about 35, it sure looks like it's polynomial. <coughs> Love this old question. X squared plus y squared plus z squared. Is that partition regular? Pretty good. Does every two coloring of n have a monochromatic solution to that equation? I conjecture it is. Well, here is a two coloring of 1 to 7,824 with no monochromatic solution. And the white cells could be red or blue. It doesn't matter. Do anything you want. You still won't get it. 7824. However, that's not possible. If you go to 7825. Huh. Any R coloring, I mean any two coloring integers of 1 to n for n is a, must have a monochromatic solution of that. And that's a very recent result, hasn't appeared yet actually. And uh, it was by some computer scientists in Austin, in Kentucky. And uh, interesting thing, using these SAT solvers, the final format. 200 terabytes, a little, a little tough to check. <laughs> they uh, had about 60,000 CPU hours. And these SAT solvers are really pretty potent. I mean, you know, you have to show that every two coloring of one up to seven, eight, two, five has a monochromatic solution that, well, there's an awful lot of two colorings. <laughs> Can't check them one at a time. You better do something more clever. Uh, and here, What's the positive fraction of all these in monochromatic? It is R colors. Other quadratic, it's just unexplored. I don't know, just to get one. Uh, let me close with an unexpected twist here. Look at this linear equation. X plus Y equals Z equals 4W. It's easy. It's not partition regular. It's easy to four color the integers so you don't have monochromatic solution. Same coloring we used before. But suppose you ask, must every R coloring of the positive reals have a monochromatic solution? Now you're coloring the real. Well, the answer is, it depends. Okay. If you're working in ZFC, then you can prevent monochromatic solutions from occurring. Because the colorings end up being have to be non-negative. However, if ZF plus LM, what is LM? LM is the axiom. Every set of reals of a leg measurable. And uh, Solovey showed that ZFC and ZF plus LM are equally consistent. You can use ZFC, or if you don't like that, you can use ZF plus L, just as consistent. Although we don't really know if they're either consistent. But I got these open. Yeah, right, 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 right. And so here the answer is yes, in ZF plus LM, we listened to the paper of Gregoricic, Jacob Fox, and, and uh, myself. Uh, which sets of equations have this decision? X plus Y equals Z, it doesn't matter. But x plus y plus equals 4w, it does matter. So we don't know. Finally, classic conjecture of Erdős, that if you have an infinite set of summary circles diverges, then it must contain k term progressions for every k. And uh, you have for $3,000 for that. As a warm up, try to prove that k equals 3. Yeah. And if you like working in more dimensions, there's a two dimensional version of this. If you have a subset of the lattice points with the sum of their superficial squares of the distance from the origin is discovered, then it has to have four vertices at the square or you know, kind of analog. Well, okay, well, there's a nice cartoon which I won't show. Erdish, Paul Erdish is looking at the, the, the book, the book of all best possible solutions. And now maybe he knows, he knows the answer, but you open the pages of the book, it says, trivial. <laughs> uh, well, OK, so So I hope I gave you a little flavor for kind of this branch of number theory. There's lots of interesting questions, and they all tie the, uh, back to Krishna and Erdish and Ramsey. And, uh, so thanks. Uh, we 
are running just a little late, so we'll have a break now and resume at around 10.15.